Nitrogen and argon, well, the, ma the majority is nitrogen. When lightning strikes the earth, it burns the air. That air is embedded in the ground where nitrogen-fixing bacteria interact with the nitrates that are put in from the lightning strike. Yeah. And then it turns it into fixed nitrogen, which becomes the only form of fertilizer prior to the fertilizer company. Okay. In other words, the whole world has been running fine for billions of years with lightning. But we yeah. have to grow more food, so we got to add fertilizer, which costs up to $1,000 an acre. Okay, well, if you just burn air through a pipe with lightning in it and create a tornado in there, <laughs> you get nitric oxide out the other end, and if you th shoot that into a venturi with a water pump on a spray tank with a chisel, you know, to stick it in the ground, then the nitrogen-fixing bacteria will turn it into fixed nitrogen, and it don't cost you any more than 60 watts to run off the tractor battery. <laughs> and you can make all you want because air is free. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. How fun this is going to be. Uh, now, before we get too far, I don't you know, drag you out here all day, and I've got 4 o'clock coming up with the last last little stretch of my regimen here. Yes, uh, when we were, I was leaving the other day, the, the little device that has a vortex created in the middle of it, you know? Yeah. That one that, and I stuck my finger in there, and I was telling, called you the next day and said my time time went, went haywire. Matter of fact, it's still all confused. Well, uh, that's what I was speaking about, you know, where the other dimensions start sending energy back into ours. That's a demonstration of energy going in the system of a little prototype model where I first discovered this phenomenon. And all that's in there is a hard drive platter with a coil on it that creates a standing magnetic wave on it, like waves on an ocean. Yeah. And then I get them spinning, and I find the right rate where the waves catch each other just at the right time when the next wave comes along until it goes ballistic, okay? And because it's a circle, like a donut, it looks like a flat, like a donut somebody run over with a car, flat as a pancake. It's a hard drive platter out of an old five and a quarter inch hard drive. Aluminum is diamagnetic okay and yeah. iron is magnetic well when the diamagnetic and the magnetic interact which is the same thing I'm doing in my heater the power coming out is 400 times greater than the power going in and suddenly you can light up lights that aren't even connected in midair hanging nearby with just <laughs> some iron and a piece of wire on it but yet there's two lights on the input that are the same lights as you're lighting up and they don't even glow and then when you put a measurement system on it, it's like point zero zero five n and off the scale on the 20-volt scale, which is like 400 to 1 gain, okay? And, and I never could figure out how to get that into something you could use <laughs> until I built the heater. And then I go, well, it's the same damn thing. It's just uh, now it's actually useful for something. Oh, my you know? God. And so Listen. what you're saying there is, is a mini demo of the principles behind it. <laughs> oh, and that's God. interdimensional coupling. That's boson fermion interactions. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, th the story wouldn't be complete, and I'm, I, I, I've got me a glass of water here so that I won't, when I, if I do start laughing, I can, I can clear my throat, because it is very interesting to hear the event that took place when, these things in your mind started accelerating when you met. You went to that Tesla thing or what have you, and ended up yeah, out by the corner. The Extraordinary Science Convention, 1996, and uh, we witnessed many a uh, what I would call government intervention in the brilliant minds of our country who tried to gather to, in honor of Mr. Tesla and Nikola Tesla, carry out his inventorship and share ideas with one another at a, in a group that would tell one another what we were doing so we could all share. We had CIA operatives there, and they were filming people and threatening people, and they threatened me. And, of course, some of the people we met decided they were going to have a dinner the last night up on a mountain next to Norad. So we decided to go up there and take them up on their hospitality. So about four of us piled into a car, and we went up the mountain and found the house and started cooking salmon and drinking the vino and, you know, beer and 
basically hanging out. And one of the guys that I'd met during this trip that kind of hung out in my room was a Mayan Indian named Ryan. And people had told me in years prior he'd been there. And at one point, one of the guys that had been there said he picked up a rock off the ground, just a common pebble, closed his hand, opened it up, and had about a 50-carat diamond in his hand. Handed it to him, let him handle it, put it back in the sand, closed his hand, turned it back in the rock, dropped it on the ground again. This guy was not normal. He was my buddy. So Ron disappeared while we were eating dinner, because he was up there. And uh, after we got done eating, he says, you know, you need to come with me. He pointed at me. I go, what for? He says, you're going for a ride. I said, what do you mean going for a ride? He points in the sky and does a swirl with his finger, you know, on a Merkaba ship. <laughs> I said, okay, well, let's go find out what's going on. So we're all laughing and having a good old time. And then the guy that owns the place says, oh, by the way, where are you at out there? He says, over by this, you know, thing down there on the left in, in that clearing. He said, do you see that cave down there? There's a grizzly bear living in that cave. I'm getting my gun. So the guy comes out of the house with a full-blown SKS assault rifle with a couple extra banana clips, a pistol, and a knife, just in case. So we go cruising down through the dark in the woods on this mountain and find the clearing, and we sit on a log in front of the beer cave with our backs to the beer cave. Yeah. And the Indian starts making this sound, which is called lay a wish, but you don't say it that way. It's a special way of doing it. It's like singing it. The first time he did it, every bug, tree, critter, including the bear, answered him, and my hair stood up on my head and on the back of my neck. And I saw the guy next to me with the gun getting real irritated because the bear was a growling. That everything started talking to y'all? Everything on that mountain, every living thing, every tree, every plant, every bug within range of his voice spoke back in unison. Good God. And he did it three times, and each time it got louder. After the third time, he looked in the sky, and yellow streaks of light came from south to north in parallel and west to east. And it formed a grid that stayed in the sky like a holodeck off the Starship Enterprise. And then the ship started to appear in a triangular shape, like it was coming out of another dimension. And he says, you, come over here and get in the middle of the circle. You're going for a ride. So I get up, and about that time, the guy on with the gun lost it and started shooting at the ship, which, of course, it immediately shot out in the field a couple of miles away and hovered. And then he started shooting at us. Good. So this is like... It probably midnight. Three hours later, we still hear gunshots, but we're over on a campsite up over his house. And I decided to peek over the edge because I thought he was getting kind of close. The shots were getting louder. He was firing at everything that moved because he was completely out of it. Yeah. And I stuck my face over the edge, and I basically stood there, and then he unloaded a whole clip on me. And the Indian put his hand in the air, and one of the bullets went over my right ear, and then he put his hand up, and he stopped all the bullets in midair between in front of me and between me and him, and they all fell to the ground. Good so, God. well, that was, uh, <clears throat> it was time to go, because my buddy was in the house, fell asleep on the couch, didn't come out in the woods, heard the gunshots, because he was right by the house, come out, grabbed him by the arms, took the gun away from him. We all ran down the hill, trying to figure out what the hell was going on, so we should call the cops or run for our lives, Okay. We shook the guy, and he goes, what happened? What happened? And we told him what he did, and he couldn't remember any of it. So it was time to go. So we took off down the mountain, about halfway off the mountain. This UFO was hovering over a field. The Indian had to get out and make peace and apologize. And then all the F-16s and the choppers showed up from NORAD, which was right next door. <laughs> and so we figured it was time to be heading back to Colorado Springs before we got the tank, because we had to fly out in the morning. So we blew down to the hotel and crashed, and got a lot of alcohol in the bar. Then I came home and I even got more alcohol because now I had post-traumatic stress disorder from this. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm, you know, putting all this on audio tape. I actually recorded the whole thing. I got a copy of it to this day of what happened when I got back with a bottle of wild turkey Yeah. because I was having a hard time dealing with this. And I'm practicing the sound that the Indian made. He taught me a language while he was here. And I'm in the garage with my friend, and I had been practicing this, and he came over with some beer. 
So I decided, you know, after a few beers, I had to go pee. So I went outside. And I'm looking across the uh, field I live in, which is there's a parking lot there. And there's a college next door. And I see the guard running around with his flashlight like a crazy man. Then I see what he's chasing. It's a blue ball of light about 18 inches in diameter. So I'm going, hey, come out here. you got to see this. This is going to be a, something fun. <laughs> so my buddy comes out, and I close my eyes, and I go, okay, you're a blue light. And I just said, lay a wish. That means calling the blue light. So I just close my eyes. I'm the one that called you. And to think I'm shooting across the field and stuff right in front of my face. I mean, nose to the ball. 18 inches crackling and snapping like lightning. Yeah. I reached my arm up to touch it, and it said no. I put my arm down, and I blacked out. And now I'm going to relate what they told me, because I don't remember this part, other than I can tell you what I saw. I saw symbols and schematics and crop circles in my head, like flashing TV pictures. What they told me was I just froze, and they were standing there because the guard had walked clear across the field by the time I woke up, and that's about probably a good mile. And he was standing at the end of my driveway, and uh, both of them told me the thing started shooting lightning both into my head, into my temples. <laughs> okay. And uh, I've never been the same since, but what happened next was I woke up, and that was flying away. I went across the road into a golf course, and then this lights on this craft. It looked like an aircraft coming in for a landing on a runway at night with headlights on it, landing lights. Only it wasn't, yeah. because it zigzagged like a spiral on the way down. And then it went into a glide path. This thing flew into it. It stopped. Turned into a round disc. Lights went around for about a minute, and it shot straight up in the sky and went out of the atmosphere. My buddy that was in my house drinking beer with me got five DUIs and ended up in prison because he couldn't handle it. Lost his job. The guard quit his job that night. And I ran into him again, and he was, like, scared to death of me because of what I'd done, and I actually went to the casino where he was working, and I won um, 10 jackpots on 10 slot machines side by side, and they threw me out <laughs> and refused to pay me, and I was thrown out of the casino for that, and that's the kind of capability I suddenly had I never had before, okay, and that's just the tip of the iceberg because the technological stuff that I got from that thing I've been building ever since, and it's been... You know, a long time ago, because it's 2011 now, and that was 96. And, well, uh, these these other people out there that may be running parallel thinking, you know, at least you someone you can talk to that understands, you know, this. Well, or, have other, you ever met other, anybody like that out there? Or knowing people this? have gone through experiences. I know of no one that's gone through this type of close encounter, and I did not report it to the government because it will lock me up. If yeah. you have that kind of contact with an alien that falls under a government, uh, you can consider that to be an alien intelligence. And if you interact with it on a direct level, then they can literally have a, there's a law in place where they can grab you and hold you forever. Huh. I never reported it. Yeah. <clears throat> have you ever talked to any of these other people that in quest of uh, like the uh, the that uh, the heat deal or other people that are along the same path of seeking what you... I I went from the time in, like, about 94, I was working for a corporation, and I got downsized into a half-time job where I still got paid the same amount of money. I'd get on an airplane on Wednesday, go fly out to some inventor that was well into his years and very well educated and go live with him every weekend and document their work and learn from them and then fly back and go back to my regular job as an engineer again. And I did this for like two years. Yeah. And got involved in a lot of projects with them and learned a lot of things you'll never find out in any book. Yeah. Made me a unique kind of individual. What about the guy that, I mean, the molasses at someone's front door, the, the 